Mark, uh, you uh, were the instructor for that last scenario. Uh, do you want to take us through it? Okay, yeah, basically we had a scenario where um, a guy had been cutting wood as a tractor had come past with a heavy trailer and it had caught him and taken him under the back wheels and he had some quite serious injuries to his lower legs and probably his pelvis. Uh, the main issues for, that we were trying to, uh, to get over in our training was the massive hemorrhage control, the potential for bleeding internally as well as externally and then how that was managed. So Mark, this particular farmer had sustained a wound to a very difficult area to control blood loss. Yes, I mean the, the wound to one side could be tourniqueted and managed very quickly. The other side was more challenging. They could get direct pressure on by exposing it and getting good pressure on, but then they then needed to do something more definitive and a tourniquet wasn't, wasn't of any value because they couldn't get above it. So what I was looking for was the wound to be packed. Now, you could pack it with a simple ambulance dressing, um, but really the ideal agent would have been a hemostatic agent, like Salox of some kind. And I know we noticed that several of the groups were just going direct for a big wad of the dressing. And what we we're really looking for is the idea of opening the dressing out. It's usually a two-person job. Mm. Somebody feeds the dressing as a, like a ribbon, and the second person is constantly feeding that in and packing the wound and filling the cavity. I think it's important to emphasise to viewers that by opening the dressing out, you're increasing the surface area of the dressing. Yeah, it's absolutely crucial, that, particularly if you're using a hemostatic agent because it gives us much exposure to the active agent. Yeah, So you're opening it up and it's a technique surgeons have used for years in the operating theatres with contaminated wounds after they've cleaned them. But it's the same thing, you're getting maximum exposure of the dressing or the agent to, to the wound to control the bleeding. And again, in that sort of a scenario, what you're trying to do is control catastrophic hemorrhage. And so, you know, irrigating the wound with water or anything like that isn't a priority. No, not at all. And, and one of the other big distractions is often bandaging. This is not the time for bandaging. Bandage to me comes later, it comes in our sea. So once we've done hemorrhage control, we do our airway, our respiration, and then we come back and revisit the wounds. Are they still bleeding or are we still controlled? If they're controlled, let's go for a, a nice combat dressing or a, or a pressure dressing on it now at that stage. So hemorrhage control is, is all about turning the tap off, direct pressure, tourniquets, hemostatics. It's not about bandaging. And again, what I noticed was that you dedicated a person, once that, once that wound was packed, you dedicated a person to keeping and maintaining pressure on that wound. Absolutely. I mean, hemostatic agents are phenomenal, but you've still got to apply the direct pressure. They're not magical. They, they still need firm direct pressure on them. And if you haven't got a hemostatic agent, even more so with a standard dressing. Pressure, direct pressure, we know will control about 90% of bleeds. So then you moved on from direct pressure to other uh, ways of controlling and improving coagulation. Yeah, well, we're obviously conscious that this chap uh, has, has lost a lot of blood volume. He's likely to be moving towards the, the traumatic coagulopathy problems we deal with. So things like simple things like keeping him warm is going to be a huge priority. <clears throat> Ideally, minimising the degree of shock and then also thinking about active agents such as tranexamic acid to, to avoid the breakdown of clot that we know starts to occur in the worst cases. And again, what we also want to avoid is dilutional coagulopathy, where we dilute all the good pieces of the blood uh, that are involved yeah, with clot yeah. formation. Absolutely. I think, you know, if we'd seen that scenario a number of years ago, we'd have put in big lines in, we'd have been pushing fluids in, crystalloids particularly. You notice we weren't using fluids at all. Uh, on one or two of the groups, he did get into a little bit of shock and he did start to deteriorate. His conscious level was going and we didn't go for crystalloid, we went for blood because we had it. If you haven't got blood, well, then you may have to resort to crystalloid, but 250 mil aliquots rather than the traditional poor litres and litres in. We had an unfortunate situation where a, uh, a victim got caught in a, I think it was a, a silage maker or a, some yeah, sort of a piece of machinery. Machine. Yep, yep. Yeah, some sort of a piece of machinery. Um, there were a number of priorities uh, and a number of decisions that had to be made. The first was around pain relief. Yes. And it was interesting to see the algorithm that people used in terms of what pain relief agents they chose and why. Yep. I mean, there were, you're absolutely right, and many were immediately saying ketamine, morphine, and we said, well, how, we've got no access at this stage, how are you going to get some effective pain, uh, painkiller management immediately for this person? And so then we started to move into some of the newer alternatives. Um, Penthrox came up, Entonox, intranasal obviously was another option if using fentanyl particularly, and all these things allowed them to get some immediate pain management before we got access. There was discussion around IM ketamine, um, and we were discussing how that can be slower in onset and a little bit unpredictable. 
and then but then finally once we got IV access there was general agreement that ketamine was probably the drug of choice for that sort of incident. Ketamine being beautiful because it maintains the patient's airway, it's sympathomimetic so they don't drop their blood pressure yep. and uh, they continue breathing spontaneously, they don't get the respiratory depressant effects Absolutely. of the, the opioid agents. And that was really important because the casualty was actually stood up yeah. with their arm trapped in the machine so the potential for postural drop in blood pressure, particularly with things like morphine, I mean that was a very real possibility. Sure. The other thing um, I noticed was the hand was stuck in the machine and you guys didn't know whether there was catastrophic hemorrhage happening blind, uh, that you were blind to. Yeah. So I think somebody put on a tourniquet in the first instance to gain control. Yeah, I mean, it, we, we wanted them to do that because, as you say, you couldn't see what was going on inside. And although a few commented the fact they couldn't see any blood, the arm was in a machine and the blood could have been inside the machine. So we were looking for that tourniquet to go in early. One group. We chose not to put it on and we wanted to wait and I asked them, you know, give me a reason why you wouldn't put a tourniquet on, tell me why and they couldn't really give me a good reason. So you get one on early, you can always take it off if when the arm comes out there's no bleeding. One of the things I noticed about that scenario was the level of noise that was at the scene and it's very hard to think. Um, what's the advice to responders who land in that situation? You've got a, you know, somebody who's screaming in pain, you've got a tractor that's making a huge amount of noise, possibly a machine as well. What's the, what, what, what advice did the responders have um, and what was their experience and what is the best thing to do? You're absolutely right, Connor. I mean, we, we spent a lot of time on that um, and that particular issues of scene safety and, and we deliberately had the machines on and running when they arrived because I think they were all shocked by how noisy they were, mm. particularly how these machines high rev when they're, when they're being used operationally. So the first thing we said is get get the farmer, get hold of the farmer if hopefully he's not the one who's been injured, but get hold of somebody from the farm site to get the machinery shut down. They're also going to be the experts in terms of the safety of the machine. When fire and rescue arrived, we were trying to get over the message that ultimately fire and rescue, the officer in charge, he is the one who's going to be responsible for the safety. Um, but in the early stages, you know, use whoever you've got around who knows the machine, knows the farm, knows if there's any livestock around as well. Mark, what came through in those scenarios was the importance of crew resource management or CRM. Yes. Um, I suppose there are certain things that are unique to the farming environment, that are unique to the injury scenario, um, that are worth highlighting. Mm. I think in any scenario a good team leader is really important and certainly whether we ran the scenarios the first one we didn't have a team leader we just let them run and the second one we introduced one and I think they all saw how important that is as sort of the hub for the information and a two-way exchange. Scene safety is a big one you've got firefighters you've got other people there but if you haven't you may have to allocate one member of the team just on safety I mean a farm is a really dangerous place and whilst you might not do that in other environments you may do it on a busy motorway or a busy road I would do the same on a farm. That person could be looking after kit and equipment as well, um, but defining those roles early and then also f sharing your model of what you found and what your plan is. And if that changes, you need the whole team to be aware of that and trying to get that message over.